right, gents. Maths this week or this morning. Dimensional analysis. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is just some of the domain and how we can analyse how we can try to use the dimensions to try to fill in the dimensions of life. So it's important to realise that it only makes sense to add, if we're going to add quantities together, that they've both got the same dimension. We can't add time and mass or area and volume. We can only add mass to mass. We can only add volume to volume. Okay. Five fundamental dimensions. And we're talking dimensions here, not units. So mass and this is the way we say that dimensions of mass are a capital M in brackets. Dimensions of length, L. The dimensions of time is P. Temperature, K. And electrical current, I. All other mechanical electrical quantities can ex be expressed in terms of powers of these five quantities. So all others are made up from them five. Okay. So your mass could be, that's the dimension, could be in kilograms, could be in tons, could be in pounds, stones. Yep, so it can be any of the units of mass. Right? Length can be meters, centimeters, millimeters, but the dimension is the length. So if we, if we take a look as an example, the fundamental dimensions of velocity, the usual units, the standard units, SI units are in meters, meters per second, and acceleration, the units are meters per second squared, forces mass times acceleration. So we can derive the dimensions of those quantities using the formula. So velocity, meters per second, meters is a length, seconds is time, so it's length divided by time, L of a T, or more normally we'd write that by bringing the T up the top and making the index negative, LT to the minus one. So the dimensions of velocity are LT to the minus one. You take acceleration, that is length divided by time squared, meters per second squared. So we've got L on the top, T squared on the bottom, which we bring up to be T to the minus two, using the laws of indices. Forces mass times acceleration. So the mass is dimension m. Acceleration from the previous example is l t to the minus two. So the dimensions of force are l m l t to the minus two. Okay. So the for all the other quantities we might want to calculate, the, the dimensions are made up from these five fundamental dimensions. Yep. Any questions so far? That's just a, a way of expressing the dimensions of mass R. No, it's not, it's not like that one. Dimensions of common quantities. So that table is there for reference. And if we look at it today, I'll give you back to it. In the notes that I 
another 60, isn't it? Could be uh, S4 times 60 times 60, 864. A simple example, but nevertheless it, it shows that you can, it's like you're converting to different um, units as you go from one quantity to another. We'll look at some more significant examples of that as well. that one. If a flange has 16 holes, with a hole requiring one bolt in each, one bolt and nut, and each bolt requiring two washers. Sorry, each, each hole requiring one bolt, comma, and each bolt requiring one and each bolt requiring two washers. Yeah, so it's a flange. Do you all know what a flange is? Yeah. No, Louis? If you had two pieces of pipe, yeah. You want them to join together, put a flange on the end with a load of holes in it. Same on the other piece comes from this way, bolted together with a gasket through. Yep. So this flange has got 16 holes, and they each require one bolt, and each bolt requires two washers. Use dimensional analysis to determine the number of washers required to make off two flange joints. So how, do, how would we write that out in dimensional analysis terms? Any 
wrong there? Sixteen fold per branch. Yep. So two flanges. Yep. Well, that's just for completeness, keeping them all. Yep. And what else? Two washers. And again, this is a very simple example, right? But it's worthwhile just starting with a simple example. So we got flanges that cancel out. Yeah. 16 times 2 times 2 equals 64. What we ought to really done here, because you're going to say, why don't that cancel? So that's 16 volts, because then the volts cancel in as well. Yep. Okay. On the next page, I've got another table. Um, what you might, what I might be handy to do in a minute is, if you want, just take a picture of these two tables on your phones or something, so you've got them. Okay. We're looking at converting between different units here, in many cases. So there's a there's a table I've made there that covers all the the um, units we're going to use today. And that table is it uh, I know is in the assignment as well for you to use that. So if you can't if it's not on there, you can easily find look it up on the internet, Google it, you'll soon find a conversion factor. So an R sixty minutes, minutes, sixty seconds and so on. A lot of them you'll know anyway, but some of you some of them you won't directly. Okay, so there's a handy table of uh, conversion factors. If you want to take a picture of that one, please do, and then I'll put the other one up, and then you'll you'll have them to use later if you need them. A small generating set uses, on average, half a litre of fuel every hour. Using dimensional analysis, calculate the following: time between tank refills. If the fuel tank holds six and a half gallons of fuel, and the cost of fuel for one week, if fuel is 125 a litre, and the generator runs for eight hours per day on six days of each week. Okay. So, just to, I'll let you let you have a go at that problem. But one thing to think about is what dimensions. Are we heading for looking for the quantity we're looking for? Time, yeah, and what? What's the units of the answer going to be? Do you think? Realistically, we've 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 got um. The number of gallons in a tank, yep, hours could be involved. There's going to be time in it. What we're looking for is the time it takes to empty one tank. Yep. So A, there's going to be a time, let's say hours, 
per tank. That gives you an idea whether, whether you're right when you've done the analysis. Because so when you've done all your cancelling, that's what you could end up with. For B, cost. Cost of fuel for one week. So that's going to be cost over week, isn't it? Okay. Have a go. So if you can write those two out in that longhand way, cancel out the units that cancel out and find an answer to those two problems. You do you got I here, which is you've got six as six point five this in one tank. Yeah. Sorry, we've got to convert it to meat, isn't we? 6.5 gallons in one tank. We need we need litres. Yeah, because we've got some. We've got um, our usage in litres per hour. So we need to convert that to litres. So the conversion factor is that there are 4.546. Meters in one gallon. Yeah, so that'll get us from a tank measured in gallons to a tank measured in liters. Yeah, and then lastly, it use it takes one hour. In one hour, it uses 0.5. Yep. Well, it's I can see what it looks like. Point cancel then, no other. Hmm. I've definitely got to go that way up. Then that cancel, that cancel, that cancel, that cancel. That's the tank cancel. It's the liters that cancel, not the number. Last year's class didn't notice this. Oh, no, tank tank shouldn't cancel, should it? Because what we want is the time it takes to empty one tank. Yeah? So tank won't cancel. So we got 6.5 times 4.546 times 1 over 0.5. The same as like the time by 2. And the answer is about 59. Pause. Not, not.
which is what you're doing. Yeah. But the 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 lion out is shown where it comes from. Yeah. Okay. Have a go at that one. Bill has been working in the nut and bolt factory for the past 30 years. His job is to pack 10 nuts and bolts, a plastic bag, seal the bag. Every hour produces 254 bags of nuts and bolts, works five days a week and eight hours a day, and he's paid every two weeks. What his packet is £840.43. How many packs of nuts and bolts will he have to produce in order to earn his first million? Has anybody noticed his, his name has even changed in that question? Okay, that's copied straight out of a book, so there you go. Have a go and see if you can do that one. How long will he have to work in order to earn his first million pounds? I'm going to move on to using dimensional analysis to derive units and check equation validity. Because dimensional analysis allows you to treat dimensions as an equation, algebraically, and cancel, this allows the units constants to be derived and for equations to be checked for validity. So you can find the units of constants, and you can check that your equation you've got is a valid one. First of all, we said right up the front that you can't add items of different dimensions. You can't add length and area together. You can only add length and length, or an area to an area. So, first of all, any equation that you've got must have the same units on both the left hand and the right hand side. Because you can't say nuts is equal to bolts or hours are equal to um, meters. You can only say hours are equal to hours or a time dimension is equal to time. Also, any terms that are added or subtracted from each other on one side of the equation, they must also have the same dimensions. Yeah? So if you've got more than one quantity on one side of the equation, both of those quantities must have the same dimensions overall. Right? If the equation is valid, so if these dimensions are all balanced, it is said to be dimensionally homogeneous fancy word for equal, okay? So both sides of the equation is equal in terms of its dimensions. Not necessarily units, but dimensions, okay? So, for example, consider the equation for the period t seconds of a pendulum of length L. It's a common formula in engineering and science. Gives you the time of a swing of a pendulum. It's 2 pi times root L of a G. T is a period of time, so as dimensions T, you need to check that the right hand side of the expression also has dimensions of t. Yeah? So what we want to do is remember that two, the 2 pi in front is a constant. And that's dimensionless. That's just, an, that's just two numbers multiplied together. The number 2 and the number 3.142 and however many other decimal places we've got. So it doesn't have any dimensions. Some constants do have dimensions, but this one doesn't. G is the acceleration due to gravity. So acceleration, if you look back at your table, has dimensions of length times time to the minus two. 
meters per second squared is the standard one. And L is the length of the pendulum, so it's got dimensions of length. So the complete dimensions of the expression are, we've got T on the left hand side, okay? On the right hand side, the dimensions of the length are length, the dimensions of G are LT to the minus two, okay? We can cancel out the two L's there and end up with one over T to the minus two, which we can bring back up the top. So we can bring that back up there and make the index positive. Remember that from the laws of indices. Today, you're gonna to get to know one of the reasons why we did the laws of indices. So we're left with the square root of t squared, and then the square root and the square cancel out to leave dimensions of t. So that equation, 2 pi root L over g, t is equal to, is dimensionally homogeneous because the dimensions of the left-hand side are equal to the dimensions of the right-hand side. Okay. Any questions so far? Has anybody not follow that cancelling or anything like that? Okay. So not only can we check that, we can also derive the dimensions of a constant. So Bernoulli's equation, you will come across this when you study with Mr. Winter next year in semester one when you do um, pneumatics and hydraulics. I don't understand the equation, but I know but if you write it in that form, it equals a constant. So it's pressure, P is pressure. The little Greek letter rho there is density. V is velocity. Z is a height, so that's a length. And G is acceleration due to gravity. Okay. What we're saying is, find the dimensions of that constant constant that is Bernoulli's equation. Okay. So if we look at that, and we look back at our table, this half is just a constant and it's dimensionless. So you can forget that. It doesn't have any dimensions anyway. P, pressure, has dimensions of L, M, L to the minus 1, T to the minus 2. So that's the P bit. Yeah. And then rho is uh, density. What are the units of density? Units. Kilograms per meter T. So what are the other, the other units, or that a, a set of units, so what are the dimensions? M, L to the minus 3. That's that bit, that's rho. Yeah. And then we've got V squared, well the dimensions of velocity are length T to the minus 1 length per time, okay? And then we're, we've got that in brackets because we need to square it because we've got V squared. We'll follow that. And then, so this bit is V squared. ML to the minus three, that's another lot of rho. Okay, and LT to the minus 2, that's G, that's an acceleration. 
Okay. And L is the length to this Z. That's bit Z. So that's where um, that's the dimensions of that. The pressure times the density times the volume squared. Sorry, a pressure multiplied by the density times volume squared plus the density times the acceleration due to gravity times the length. Yeah? Okay? Okay, those type, I'll use ML, um, which one? No, d density is equal to mass divided by volume. Yeah, okay. So, Common or the SI unit of density is kilograms per meter cube. Yeah. But the why it becomes minus is more around the laws of indices. Because here's our mass and our volume, the dimensions. Yeah. To the three, so mass is to the one by the laws of indices. We can bring it's just about ease of ease of writing in a way and cancelling is that we can bring the volume up the top and make the index minus. Three. And volume is length, volume, volume is length time to the minus one. Ah, no, hang on. Row is a but Yeah, I'm talking about density here. Density is mass per length cubed. Yeah. Volume is length cubed. You may me get velocity, that is, it's not volume, it's velocity. See me going off trying to explain something has made got me in a bit of a muddle there because I've ended up with two V's. Volume, volume is L cubed, isn't it? Yeah. L to minus three, yeah? Yeah, okay. So that's all it is, is that allows us to move, move those quantities from the bottom, from being a denominator to being in the numerator. V squared can come one over to the minus two. Yep. All right. That's all that is. Just around the laws of indices. All right. Anyway, going on to my next page because I couldn't fit it all on that page. There's that expression again. Okay. So that bit was our. Let's put that back on. That's the pressure. P plus uh, rho g, uh, no, rho v squared, velocity squared. So that's rho, that's v squared, and they're multiplied together. And that's plus, and that's rho as well. 
and that is gravity and that is centre for length or height. Okay, so if we look at that middle term, we've got two lots of L in there. We've got L to the minus three and L to the two. Yep, so just looking at that middle term for a minute, it is, there it is, but L and L. So you can make that by the laws of indices, L to the minus three, we're multiplying two lengths together, we add the indices. So minus three plus two, that leaves ML to the minus one, T to the minus two. Everybody follow that. So we're just working on that term down there. Take these two L's and divide them in so we've got one version of L. So looking at that, We can now simplify the third term. The third term is ML to the minus 3, LT to the minus 2 times L. Where did that come from? Ah, hang on. I've gone wrong here. Sorry guys. Not helping. First, we've got a bracketed term in the middle here we need to deal with. Right? So we've got LT to the minus one all squared. There it is. So when we have a term in brackets with powers, so L would be to the power of 1, but we don't normally write it. T is to the power of minus 1. We have to multiply this index here by the indexes inside. So we end up with L to the 2 times 1, 2 times 1, T to the 2 times minus 1. LT squared, T to the minus 2. And this is putting that back in the full equation. Then we can simplify that term. So we've added together the index of the two L terms. Become, so everything in the middle there is ML minus 1, C to the minus 2. And there it is back in the full equation. <laughs> we've got a third term that we can simplify because we've got one, two, three L terms. And now I'll use a different colour. One, two, three L terms. So we can bring those two, those together. ML to the minus three plus 1, 2. Yep. So we end up with ML to the minus 1, T to the minus 2. Yep. And we should have the same dimensions in all three now. So that's the final dimensions of the third term. Final dimensions of the middle term was that. And the dimensions of the first term are that. They're all the same. So they'll all add together, 
and therefore dimensions of the constant You're adding the t that's the, that minus two is with the t. Uh, okay. Yeah, you've got l to the minus three yeah. times l to the one times l to the one. Yeah. It's minus three plus two. Yeah. First term dimensions are m l minus one t minus two. Second term dimensions, finally, were the same. M, L, minus 1, T minus 2. And the third ones eventually ended up the same. M, L, minus 1, T minus 2. That has to be like that because we want to add them all together. And therefore, the dimensions of that Bernoulli's constant are mass per length per time squared. Yeah. So by simplifying each of the dimensions that make up that equation, because that equation is equal to a constant, that constant has, has those di ML squared by the demi uh, dimensions of M L minus one B minus two. Yep. Yeah, but remember what they are. They're all di they're the dimensions of the three parts of the equation. Yeah, when they've b all been simplified. So you've got three terms in the equation. Let's go back to the equation. Got three terms. There's a term, pressure. Yeah. Dimensions m l minus one t minus two. You've got a constant that we can ignore. There's another term. Density times volume squared, uh, velocity squared, another term. When we simplify that, the dimensions of it are ml minus 1, t minus 2. Yeah. So it's a pressure. That, that bit in there is another pressure. And we need it to be pressure, because otherwise we can't add it to this pressure, can we? Will everybody see that? And then, density times the acceleration due to gravity times the height is another pressure, because its dimensions, when we simplify, end up as m l minus 1 t minus 2. So if all of them are pressures, Three pressures add together equals a pressure. Bernoulli's equation says under these conditions, pressure remains constant. Yeah. Mark will teach you that much better than I ever will. But it's a it's a it's a, a condition where pressure under under conditions pressure will remain constant. So what's saying there is, if one of these quantities changes, something else changes to keep the overall pressure constant. Yeah. Okay. The 
have a go at this one. Okay. If the pressure P, by depth D of a fluid, of density rho, is given by P is equal to rho G D, where G is the acceleration due to gravity. Using dimensional analysis, show that this formula has dimensional homogeneity. homogeneity. So what are the dimensions of pressure? Dimensions of rho, which is a density. That was in the last question. <laughs> you didn't take that picture, did you, Lewis? Oh, yeah. Dimensions of density are dimensions of G length yeah and the dimensions of um, depth must be L. So use those dimensions to prove the di find out what the dimensions of um, sorry to show that this side and this side have the same dimensions, dimensional homogeneity. So your answer, to so that right hand side, all those three multiplied together should cancel to ML minus one, P minus two. So that's what you should end up with when you add those three dimensions together. Multiply those three dimensions together, sorry. Yeah. So what we've got is dimensions of that side, we know what they are, but we're multiplying L, M, L minus 3 with L, T to the minus 2 with L. Yeah. So we've only got one M. So that has to stay. Yeah. L is minus three. Yeah, plus one, two. P to the minus two. So we're bringing these two together. Mass length to the minus one. P to the minus two. And they are the same, therefore, that formula is valid and that's dimensionally homogeneous, it's balanced in terms of its dimension. Let's have a look at this one. The Euler's, the Euler's number is a dimensionless parameter. It has dimensions one. Yeah? The constant one. Given by the equation, Euler's number is rho, sorry, P, which is a pressure, divided by the density times the volume squared. Using dimensional analysis, prove that <coughs> the Euler's number has the dimensions one. In other words, all the dimensions cancel out. Okay. What we're saying is here, one is equal to P over rho V squared. 
that doesn't have any dimensions, so all the dimensions must cancel out on this side. P has the dimensions, pressure has the dimensions of P minus 2. Rho, density. Yeah, mass per length cubed. And uh, velocity L C minus one. Yeah. So the dimensions of this side are empty. There aren't any. And that's equal to the dimension M L minus one C minus two. LC to the minus one all square. Yeah. This might help if we keep the brackets round, square brackets round them to start with as well. Where would we start with, um, where would we start with the uh, simplifying? Okay. Expand these brackets, yeah. We'll put expand volume bracket. So we'd end up with Still nothing on the right side. ML minus one. Top. That bit would stay the same. L, ML minus three. And then we've got to square the indices. Oh, we've got to multiply the indices of these two by two. So that'll just going to L squared, one times two. C to the minus C. Yep, all agree. See that? But that comes from the law of indices, Lewis, that says. I squared to the 3 is equal to I to the 2 times 3. Yeah, so you've got a square inside the bracket and another power outside. You multiply these two powers together. So looking at this one, we've got L to the 1. We never write the 1, but that's there. So that comes to be L to the 2. And we've got T to the minus 2. The t to the two times minus one, which is minus two. All right. What are we going to do next? Yeah. So we're going to simplify the denominator. Yeah. So we've got an M, hang on, let's start writing this out again. So we've got nothing on that side. The top line's going to stay the same for the time being. Bottom line, the denominator, we've only got one M, so that stays. L to the minus 3 times L to the 2 becomes L to the 3 
plus t. We're multiplying them together, so we add the indices. Three, minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1. And then lastly, we've got t to the minus 2. That's just as well, because that's what we want. Maths and mass cancel. L to the minus 1 and L to the minus 1 cancel. And T to the minus 2 and T to the minus 2 cancel. We've got the same dimensions top and bottom. Therefore, any number divided by itself is equal to itself, 1. No, not itself, 1. 10 divided by 10 is 100 divided by 100 is Okay, so new dimensions this side, new dimensions like that side, Euler's number is dimensionless. A constant. All right? Again, that's another situation where it says if one thing changes in that equation, one quantity changes, the others would have to change to, to suit that because that's got to keep that result of that equation constant. So if we look at that equation, if we change pressure, then something's got to happen to the density or the velocity for that to still remain the same. Yep. All happy. Because you can be. Right. Exercise. We're going to have a look at this together. A derivation of a formula using dimensional analysis. Okay. In this exercise, what we'll do is look at how the analysis of dimensions can allow us to derive a formula for a given situation. What we need to do is consider a ball being dropped from a height. So you're holding a ball up, you're going to drop it considerably higher than I'm holding my hand now, but besides the point, okay. Assuming that the ball does not attain what's called terminal velocity, so making that assumption, it's not going to fall far enough to reach its terminal velocity. What quantities affect the velocity of the ball, how fast it's moving, just before it hits the ground? What quantities do you think would affect that? Mass. Um, by assuming, I'm going to say, by assuming we don't reach terminal to velocity, um, air resistance is not an issue. Yeah? Mass. What else? Yeah, G gravity. G, dimensions. It's an acceleration. LT to the minus two. Yeah. Anything else? Well, the velocity, we're, we're, velocity is on the left-hand side of our equation. We're trying to find out what the velocity is going to be when it hits the ground. Height, yeah. So if we were to think about this problem, there are the things we might think of in simplistic terms, if we if we ignore um, air resistance, yep. and more about that a bit later. Okay. So this suggests a formula. Right. What do you think happens if mass goes up in terms of a velocity when it hits the, the ground? 
if I said mass has increased, what do you think would happen to the velocity? So if I drop one ball, right, and that's got a certain velocity just before it hit the ground, what do you think having more mass would do to the velocity just before it hit the ground? Increase. V increase. If I had more gravity, what would happen to the velocity just before it hits the ground? Yeah? V increase. That's what you would expect, yeah? And then what if I drop it from higher? Yeah? Increase. Drop the height. Increase velocity. Increase. So what that's do, what I'm saying there is this this formula for velocity as it just before it hits the ground is directly proportional in our minds here at the moment to the mass of the object. It's directly proportional to the gravity. We're saying velocity will go up if we increase gravity, velocity will go up if we increase the mass, and that's directly proportional to the height we drop it from. So it suggests the formula of velocity is equal to some kind of arbitrary constant, because there always is one, you can't find that out unless you do some experiments, okay, times the um, mass times the length times g. That's what it suggests. Yep. And what we don't know is what the powers of these three quantities are. Yep. So we're going to give them powers that are unknown. And gravity is sorry. So it suggests a formula, V is velocity, uh, M is mass, L is height, you have got to call that height really, won't you? That's a length. Uh, L height G is acceleration. Yep. And like I said, that K is um, a constant that we don't know and couldn't calculate, couldn't find without getting some experimental data to put in our formula when we finished it. Okay. So, what do we know? What are the dimensions of the left-hand side, V? Velocity. And the dimensions of um, mass are m, and that's to the a. Dimensions of height is l to the b. Yeah. And the dimensions of um, that's an acceleration, isn't it? So the dimensions of G are LT to the minus T. All to the power C.
all follow that so far or not? And we know that this equation that we're going to um, derive has to equal, if it's going to be homogeneous, the dimensions of that bit must equal LT to the minus 1. Yeah? So, when we got some... we got bracket term here, so we need to multiply out this term. Multiply out the brackets. So we get L T to the minus 1 there is equal to M to the A, L to the B, L to the 1 times C, yeah, T to the minus 2 times C. Now what we can do is combine the L terms. So we have L T to the minus 1 is equal to M to the A, that's going to be L, L to the B times L to the C is L to the B plus B. Yeah. And then T to the minus 2C on the end. Because we got L to the B times L to the C. If that was L to the 1 times L to the 2, you'd be able to do it, wouldn't you? Because you'd say it was L to the 1 plus 2. So here, at the moment, the indexes of these are unknown. We're going to find them in a minute. So by the laws of indices, bring those two together, we've got to add those two indices. Yeah? B, C, that's times then, isn't it? Yeah? All right. So, what power of M could I put on that side and that would still be the same? Yep. I could write this as L T to the minus 1 M to the 0. And that's still the same because any number or any, any quantity to the, value, to the power of 0 is equal to 1. So we just multiplied that side by one. In other words, we've done nothing to it. All right. Always remember, if you multiply something by one, you haven't actually done anything. All right. On this side, we've got m to the a times l to the b plus c times t to the minus 2c. Taking the M terms, equate indices of M terms. So on the left hand side, we've got M to the O, and we're saying that's equal to M to the A. Therefore, I is equal to m to the o, m to the zero is equal to m to the power of a. What is a? Yeah. 
Thank you, Vinder. We said we could we could say that the left hand side has got mass to the power of zero. Anything to the power of zero is equal to one. I'm just trying to do this so you can see where the the mass disappearing comes from. Yeah. Mass to the zero is equal to mass to the power of A. Therefore A must equal zero. Must be if these two are the same then that bit there must equal that. Yeah? If they are exactly the same. That's the law of indices, the first law. A to the x times, hang on, A to the x times a to the y is equal to the a to the x plus y. So we've applied it to that, haven't we? Because we've got L to the b times L to the c equals L to the b plus c. We don't know what b and c are equal to yet, so we can't bring them together. They aren't numbers for us yet. They're just... They are numbers, but we don't know what they are, what the number is. Sorry? Yeah, well, that came from multiplying out the brackets here, didn't it? No, because there aren't any brackets. This is two numbers multiplied together. There's a multiplication symbol in there. Yeah, this this is this is the um, dimensions of um, an acceleration gravity. Yeah, and that's the power, the unknown power of that gravity. So g is to the power of something. We think it could be to the power of something, right? But at the moment we don't know what that power is. So we're given it a letter. Yeah, so when we when we when we imagined what our formula might be, we said that's going to be involved mass. That could be raised to a power. We don't know yet. Okay. Length or height above the ground. Again, that could be that could be to a power. We don't know yet. Okay. And then gravity again could be to a power, but we don't know yet. You can't you can't add powers that way. Yeah, you can multiply them. You can't add them. All right. You'd have to do the powers first. Just by by the rules of um, order. Yeah. If you've got two to the power of three and you want to add it to 2 to the power of 4, bod mass says that you've got to cube that first, power 4 that first, and then add the two results together, doesn't it? Yeah. So there isn't a law of indices for, for addition. There's a law of indices for multiplication, division, power raised to another power. Yeah and one over and all them. We did them the first week, didn't we? All right? We're getting there. We'll get there in the end. Okay, so from that, if m to the power of O is equal to m to the power of A, then A must equal v zero. What that says is mass is not a factor. It isn't in the left-hand side, and it isn't in the right-hand side. A is equal to zero. Therefore, Mass does not affect the velocity. Anyone remember who discovered that? Dr. 
Gospels from the Leland Tower of Pisa. Galileo. Yeah. I think that was like cannonballs, different sized cannonballs. And I did, I did look it up, and I think he dropped them down a sloped incline, so they actually took longer, a long enough time to be able to measure it, because that doesn't make any difference either. Okay. I had a colleague back at my last job who claimed that Galileo couldn't possibly have got a high enough to prove that in the time that he lived, but he was just trying to wind me up, I think. All right. So we've equated the indices of the m terms and found that a is equal to zero. So we can throw mass away, it's not a factor. The equate what's next? Equate the indices of t. So we take the t terms. On the left hand side, we've got t to the minus 1. And on the right hand side, we've got t to the minus 2c. Yep. Therefore, minus 1. The, ind the index on that side is equal to minus 2c. How do we get c on its own? Minus 1 is equal to minus 2c. How are these two connected together? Minus 2 and c. So what we've got to do to move over the other side? Yeah. Therefore, c is equal to minus 1 over minus 2 equals a half. Yep. Agreed? Yeah. So in our, in our formula that we're working out now, the um, T is raised to the power of a half. All right. Now we're going to equate the indices of L. On the left hand side, we've got L, L, it's L. And on the right hand side, we've got L to the power of A plus B. Am I right? No, B plus C. All right. Therefore, this is L to the 1. Yeah. And 1 is equal to. B plus C. We know that C is equal to a half. Therefore, B is also equal to a half. Therefore, them little three dots of code, mathematicians code for therefore. Sorry, I should have explained that. All right. You all follow that. Yeah. So our formula now goes like this. V is equal to K, the constant that we don't know, times a length, so a half, times 
the gravity to a half because we said it was constant times mass to the a which disappeared yep length to the b b is a half gravity to the c and c is a half so that's our formula how can we write using the laws of indices l to the half and g to the half no have a look back at your law, laws of indices root l and root g yep so to the power of a half is the square root so you can write that as k root l root g if we want to yep. and also we can say we can bring these two roots together by root lg so that is the formula that's how we derive a formula from by using dimensional analysis And you will be asked to do one similar to that in your one. Okay, there will be a question on that and a few other bits and pieces that we've covered today. Yes. Yeah. The, the dimensional now, yeah. Anybody got any overriding questions about what we've covered today? By the way, when I do the assignments, we do have, normally have a paper copy for you, and we'll talk on the day I issue it. We will just talk through the questions. Yep. So I don't completely ignore you once they've given you the assignment, but I can't give you the answers. <laughs>